Welcome back to The Man Who Won't Go Away. The more people try to quiet his voice, the stronger it gets. Any attempt made to hide him away will only bring him more into the open. His followers won't go away either. He is their one true friend because they know no matter what they do, he will never leave them. He is the one man who won't go away. How did Jesus treat women? Try reading John chapter 8. It's the story of a woman caught in the very act of adultery by the Pharisees, the religious leaders. Just try reading that story. And you see how Jesus was the greatest defender of women in the history of the human race. Read the story, my friend, of Mary Magdalene, a woman who had been possessed by seven demons, a woman who came from a life of of depravity and sin. But Jesus did not give up on her. Jesus loved her and Jesus lifted her up Jesus redeemed her. In the history of the human race, there's never, never been a defender of women such as Jesus Christ, the Son of God. He's done more for women, more for the rights of women, than all the women's libbers and all the emancipators and all the big talkers and all the waffling politicians in the history of the human race. Jesus Christ is the real deal. And if you're a woman, you should never, ever criticize Jesus because Jesus is your very best friend. Who were the friends of Jesus? Jesus is called in the scriptures the friend of sinners. Now, I think it's Luke chapter 15 where Jesus is going out to eat with the so-called sinners. The Pharisees come along and they say, this man receives sinners and goes to eat with them. Oh dear, how dreadful. And Jesus said to the Pharisees, how right you are. Jesus is the friend of sinners. If you feel a sinner today, then know this, Jesus is your friend. Jesus died to save sinners. The Bible says God so loved the world, and that's a world full of sinners. God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus is the friend of sinners. What was his attitude towards people who made a lot of mistakes? Peter messed up pretty badly. Haven't you and I on on occasions messed up pretty badly? I certainly have, and I guess you have too. There's no room for self-righteousness because we're all sinners. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. When Jesus needed a friend, a buddy, somebody to stand by him, Peter denied his Lord with cursing and swearing. But Jesus never gave up on Peter. He doesn't give up on anybody. And Jesus sent a message. He said, go tell my disciples and Peter to meet me in a certain place. He redeemed Peter. He reached out to Peter. He loved Peter, even though Peter had messed up. And God loves you, my friend. Even though you and I have messed up, he loves us. At the very end, the history tells us that Peter was crucified upside down because he didn't feel himself worthy to be crucified in the same way that his Lord had been crucified. Because... He just felt Jesus had done so much for him, and Jesus had. Never, never forget it, my brother, my sister, that Jesus is the friend of sinners. And if you feel a sinner today, then remember this, 
God loves you. Jesus loves you. And he is your friend. How did the powerful religious hierarchy, the Jewish leaders, the priests, treat Jesus? Well, Jesus tried to get along with the hierarchy because he tried to get along with everybody by showing kindness and goodness. But these people were so obsessed with their own self-righteousness that they hated him without a cause. That's what the Bible says. They hated me without a cause. And there's another big reason that the Pharisees and the religious leaders hated Jesus because they were so insecure. They were such politicians, all the time trying to climb up the slippery pole. And Jesus threatened uh, their power, their security, and their position. And that's why these religious leaders conspired to have him condemned. They handed him over to the Roman governor and they cried out, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said, what evil has he done? They said, we don't care. Just put him on the cross. The religious leaders hated him in his own day because he revealed that they were simply whited sepulchres, good on the outside, but filthy on the inside. So tragically, most of the religious leaders, though some later on came to believe in him, but most of the religious leaders, like Caiaphas and so forth, they hated him without a cause, and they hated him because he challenged their religious superiority. Were some religious leaders of that time bad and corrupt? Well, there was Nicodemus, the one who came to Jesus by night. That's how he's described all the way in the, in the Gospels. They say, Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jewish council, a big shot in Israel, one of their chief theologians who knew a great deal about theology, but who knew nothing about truth. Jesus said to him, you've got to be born again. He said, well, I don't know what does that mean. Do I have to go into my mother's womb and be born that shows you how spiritually ignorant this religious leader was. But Nicodemus came good. And the Bible tells us that a great company of the priests turned to Christ and they turned to God. Jesus is the saviour of all people. He's the saviour of religious people as well as outward sinners. Jesus loves us. And he's the best news that this world has ever heard. He's the person that this world needs today more than any other person living on the planet. The politicians don't seem to be helping us a great deal today. Certainly in the United States of America and other places that I can amen uh, mention, the politicians don't seem to be helping us a great deal. What we need is Jesus Christ. What did Jesus tell us about God? He said that he was the very image of God. He said on one occasion, I think it's John 14, he says, you want to see God? Well, he who has seen me, he said, has seen the Father. What an amazing statement. They said, you know, just show us God. Let us see God and then we're going to be happy. Jesus said, you've seen me, therefore, You've seen the Father. Everything Jesus is, God is. Jesus was the friend of sinners. God is. Jesus loved little children. They loved to get up on his knee. He said, let the little children come to me. That's what God is like. Jesus said, forgive, forgive. 490 times, and don't, don't count, just forget. That's what God is like. Listen to me. I want you to think of the very best person you know. 
the very nicest person you know, the person you'd like to emulate if you could think of the very best person. That person is a little bit like God. But Jesus, God, is a million times better. No, 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 I'm wrong. Not a million times, a trillion times better. A trillion times better than the very best person you know. He's good, he's kind, he's loving, he's forgiving. He's the very best person. How difficult is it to practice the teachings of Jesus? How difficult were his sayings, some of his sayings? Well, talking for myself, and I think I would represent a lot of people, I find some of his sayings very difficult indeed. I've heard skeptics say, oh, it's so easy to be a Christian. Anybody can be a Christian. <laughs> try being a Christian, Richard Dawkins. Try reading, try getting a Bible. When I was in Russia in the days of the communists, I had communists come to me and they, they said, you know, it's all a lot of nonsense, your Bible. So I would get, a, I gave away ten, uh, hundreds of thousands of Bibles by the grace of God with the help of my supporters. But I would say to them, go get your Bible or take this Bible that I'm giving to you now and try reading through, here we go, Try reading through Matthew 5, 6, and 7. You know the greatest weakness among people who go to church today or people who call themselves Christians? They don't know what Jesus taught. He's the Jesus they never knew. They don't even read the Bible. They, don't have a, they haven't got a clue what he taught. How difficult are those teachings, Jesus said. Well, if somebody slaps you here, turn the other side and take a slap there. You say, that's impossible. Well, that's why it's, it's difficult. That's why we need the grace of God. Jesus said, you've heard, it, it is said, love your neighbor. Yeah, well, the neighbor is a very nice person, easy to love your neighbor. Jesus said, love your enemies. He's talking about a supernatural love that comes from the heart of God. He said, Love your, your enemies. He said, uh, one of the disciples, I think, was it Peter? He said, how many times shall I uh, forgive my brother? Seven times? He thought he was being magnanimous. I'll forgive my enemy seven times. Hey, what a good boy I am. Jesus said, not seven times, 70 times seven. That's 490 times. And don't stop when you get to 491. How difficult are these teachings? We need the grace of God to be Christians and to follow Christians and to follow Christ and to be true believers. You see, we need to do more than just talk about it. We need to, we need to start to walk the talk and stop all the religious hype and follow Jesus. And that's why we need amazing grace, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found. I was blind, but now I see. The grace of God can help us to follow Christ. Why is his crucifixion so central to Christianity? Crucifixion was a living and a dying hell. I've read accounts of crucifixions. Crucifixion was predicted in the Bible a thousand years before Christ was put on the cross. The victim was usually stripped naked, nailed to the cross and often tied with bits of rope also. The cross was not as high as most people think it was low enough so people could go past quite often and gaze into the tortured faces of the victims and spit in their faces. 
Uh, Paul says, uh, he quotes the Old Testament in the book of Galatians, he says, cursed is everyone who was, who was hung on a tree. Have you ever thought about that, my friend? Just think about this. Would you please think about this? Sometimes we're very, very superficial when we talk about these things. Cursed is everyone who was hung on a tree. When Christ was hung on the tree or the cross, he came under the curse of God's law. He became sin for us. He was not a sinner. He had no sin. But the sin of the world was laid upon Christ and you know sin. Your sin was laid upon Christ. My sin was laid upon Christ. Hanging on the cross, one person said, was the gospel, the good news of God. But hanging on the cross was the creator God. Can you believe this, that Christ was God in human flesh and hanging on the cross was the creator of the universe, the the hand that flung the stars in space was the hand that was nailed to the cross. What does this tell you? It tells you that sin is rotten, degrading, evil, and immensely wicked. And it also tells you that God is immensely caring and loving. He loved you so much that he went to the cross for you. You and I cannot understand these things fully. We can only partially comprehend them. But I want you to know this, that God in Christ went to the cross to bear your sins. This Christ is not like any other person. He's not like Muhammad. He's not like Moses. He's not like St. Paul. He's not like any one of us. He is the sinless son of God. And uh, the sin of the world is laid upon him. That's why he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But most importantly, we must realize, comprehend and realize your sin and my sin was laid upon Christ. He paid the price for your sin and my sin. If you and I truly believe in him, our sins are forgiven. No wonder we say, oh, come, let us adore him. Christ the Lord, who is like unto this Christ? Is he still dead? Where is he buried? Will archaeologists uncover his bones? I can assure you, I've been to Israel more times than I can count. But I can assure you of one tremendous truth. They're never going to find the bones of Jesus. <laughs> Are you getting what I'm saying today? They're never going to find the bones of Jesus because the bones are not in any tomb in Jerusalem. Jesus was resurrected from the dead. That is a fact. You say, no, it's just a story. No, it's not just a story. Hey, get real, my friend. This is a fact. It's, it's, it, it's historical. I don't have a blind faith. We don't want blind faith. We want a faith that is based upon truth. Now, here's a question for you. What happened to the body of Jesus? Would you please tell me, what happened to the body of Jesus? Now, somebody's going to say, well, the disciples came and they stole the body of Jesus. That's nonsense. Could you imagine a dozen dispirited men and women uh, storming the Roman tomb with all those Roman soldiers? No, that's it's silly. Don't, don't insult our intelligence. Others say, well, um, the Jews got the body. The, the Jews took the body. Well, why didn't they produce the body when the disciples started to preach the resurrection? The Jews get the body? Absurd. Others say, the Romans got the body. No, that's just as silly because the Romans wanted to put down this Christian thing. The best way to put down the Christian church is by producing the body of Christ. Would you like to know where the body is? What happened to the body? Well, the body was resurrected. Jesus was raised from the dead. He was seen by hundreds of witnesses. Witnesses are the basis of the, of the law system. We have judges and we have juries and we have witnesses. 
asked Mary. She saw him. Mary, is he raised? Yes. He called my name, Maria. Asked Peter. Yes, I saw him. Asked Thomas. He said, I felt his hands. I felt the marks of the nails. I felt the side. Ask the disciples. Yes. On one occasion, he appeared to 500 people. They saw him. They talked with him. On one occasion, Jesus met with some of his disciples beside the, the Sea of Galilee, and he had a meal. He had breakfast. He had fish and bread with them. <laughs> Why do you think millions of people died as martyrs, were tortured, were butchered, were thrown to the lines in the Circus Maximus, not the Colosseum, in the Circus Maximus? Think of being thrown to wild beasts and torn to bits. Why did they do this? Would you do this if you didn't believe? They did it because of their faith that was based upon historical reality, upon fact. My friend, he's alive. Make no doubt about it. He's alive. He's well. And... Uh, He's the person who's not going to go away and he's the person the world can't get rid of. He is the living Christ, the Son of God, Yahweh Elohim, our Saviour. Is this the end of the Jesus story? Is this the end of the Jesus story? <laughs> is this the end of the Jesus story? Almighty God became a man, born of the Blessed Virgin Mary. This is incredible. He grew up as a little boy, then he became a carpenter, then he became an itinerant preacher. He showed us what God is like. And then he, he went to the cross and died for our sins. Is this the end of it? Let me read you his words. John 14, 1 to 3, let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions, many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also, listen, he's coming back. It is written, he's coming back in power and in glory. The king of the universe is coming back. He's coming back to do away with sin and to set up his kingdom. And you and I can be part of it. My appeal to you is this, from my heart to yours. Believe in Christ. Look to the Son. See the Son. Trust in the Son. Accept the Son. Believe in him. And you will have eternal life and live for eternity. This is the word of God. How can I receive forgiveness? Can I have a new life? Is there hope for me? Because of the love of God and because of Jesus, there's hope for every person. There's hope for the great atheist, the great cynic, the great skeptic, the profligate, the, ter the, the terrible sex pervert. There's plenty of those today. And there's hope for the, the run and mill, the, the ordinary, ordinary sinner like all of us. There's hope for all of us because Christ died for us. And the way to salvation is a simple way. Now, I'm going to read you a profound text out of the Bible. I urge you to read the New Testament, especially the Gospels. I, read, I urge you to read the whole Bible, but especially read Matthew, Mark, Luke and John and overcome the natural inclination to spiritual sloth. Read it and you will see the glory of God. 
Now here is this text. John chapter 6, 37 to 40. All the Father gives me will come to me. And the one who comes to me, I will by no means cast out. If you come to Christ as a penitent, he won't kick you out. He says this. For I've come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of the Father who sent me, that of all he has given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up at the last day. And this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Look at me and listen. Jesus said, we will be saved if we will see the Son, if we will look at him and believe in him. Anybody can look. You can look. There's no excuse not to look. The rich man can look. The politician can look. The proud person can look. All people can look if we look and believe in him. We will have everlasting life. I invite you today, look to Christ. Look to Christ and be saved. Believe in him and you will have everlasting life. And in spite of the powers of hell, you will be raised up at the last day. You will live for eternity. This is the word of the Lord. Believe it. Many people, no matter what their age, still have their first teddy bear. It's hard to let them go. Their stitches might be loose, the stuffing flat, one ear a little lopsided, but they were always there for us. Imagine giving a child their very first teddy bear, especially when they are sick and lonely. They will always remember that someone they didn't even know cared enough to bring them a new friend when they needed it most. Will you help the Carter Report bring cheer to these children? You can mail a bear or send a donation and we will buy the bears for you. Please send your bears or a donation to the address on the screen. For COVID protection, please send the bears in their original packaging. Thank you for your kindness in giving cheer and comfort to children in need. For a copy of today's program, please contact us at P.O. Box 1900, Thousand Oaks, California, 91358. Or in Australia, contact us at P.O. Box 861, Terrigal, New South Wales, 2260. This program is made possible through the generous support of viewers like you. We thank you for your continued support. May God richly bless you.